Today we are going to continue with the um, task of dimensionality reduction and can take actually the motivation uh, as motivation our previous topic that we discussed which was um, classification um, or can take it for actually any kind of estimation problem and most of those estimation problems actually the complexity of those algorithms depend on the dimensionality of my data. And so the question is that we can phrase in dimensionality reduction is can we actually find an alternative representation that has a smaller number of dimensions compared to the original space but still um, we can have the same expressiveness of our estimators. This can be um, estimating any type of parameters or can also be a classification system. So we start with the motivation that dimensionality has an impact on the complexity of the underlying estimation, classification, uh, regression, um, or least squares algorithm that we uh, want to apply. And if we are able to reduce the dimensionality of our input data, let's say from a 100 dimensional space to a three dimensional space, then maybe, and we have the same expressiveness in the three dimensional space compared to, to the original 100 dimensional space. Of course, this doesn't hold for all types of problems. This typically means that, for example, certain dimensions are strongly correlated with each other. So if I know one dimension, I can infer quite well what the other dimensions may be. And the goal, what we want to do today is actually reducing the dimensionality of our original input space or of our feature space in terms of classification, for example. So reduces from a very high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space um, so that we lose as little information as possible. And given that we have that, we hope that we can actually solve our problems in this, exactly the same way as we could do it before, but we are more efficient as a smaller number of dimensions is actually involved. <coughs> this holds the same for uh, classification as for other um, um, estimation techniques. And one of the things we may look into, uh, especially if you look into classification, is that if we have a smaller number of dimensions, and there may be some noise in those dimensions, or we have some dimensions which are completely ir irrelevant. If we kind of take them away before we feed that into the classification algorithms, we may even improve the classification result. But this leads kind of to the key question, what is relevant for computing the solution of our problem? <coughs> so if you're interested in classification, in classification problems, we may not, in, in, we don't have any knowledge about what we want to classify, it's very hard to find a good dimensionality reduction because we have no idea which dimension we should, for example, ignore or throw away. So we have to distinguish two tasks. One is kind of an unsupervised way where we don't have any information about a class. We're just interested, for example, in reducing um, a reconstruction error or if we have additional information, for example, about the classes of individual data points. And these are, we will discuss two approaches today mainly. This will be PCA, Principal Component Analysis, and LDA, um, uh, Linear Discriminant Analysis. Um, and these are two techniques. One is done for the unsupervised way, and the second one is done for the supervised way. And this strongly relates to this question, what is relevant for computing the underlying solutions? So the problem that we actually want to solve. You can see this with dimensionality reduction maybe as a pre-processing step. We want to reduce the dimensionality of our problem and then solve the problem with our original estimation technique or classifier or whatever we want to use. Um, there are two things to distinguish. One is, or two terms to distinguish. One is feature selection. The other one is feature ex extraction. Typically, if you talk about feature selection, we have for example, a d-dimensional space, we want to select k out of these d-dimensions and ignore all the others. So we are selecting, kind of activating certain dimensions that we want to use. So from our set of d-dimensions, we just pick k, and kind of keep the unit vectors the same, say those are the dimensions I'm interested in. So I'm keeping k of my original dimensions. In contrast to that, in feature extraction, we are typically interested in finding, again, a k-dimensional space, but this, those dimensions of our k-dimensional space do not need to be 
dimensions of our d-dimensional space. So we may combine two dimensions from the d-dimensional space into one new dimension. And what we are looking into is actually feature extraction. So what we're doing here today with principal component analysis as well as um, with LDA, we look into feature extraction. That means we can, let's say, combine multiple dimensions of our original d-dimensional space into one new dimension of our <coughs> k-dimensional space. So what we're going to do today is actually go through these three techniques, principal component analysis, the first one we look into. Then the second thing is LDA, also called Fisher LDA, in order to distinguish that from another technique which is also called LDA or abbreviated with LDA. Um, and it's called linear discriminant analysis. And then I will, we will briefly look into LLE, locally linear embedding, which is an alternative technique for dimensionality reduction which is then a non-linear technique. So these other are linear techniques and this is a uh, non-linear technique. Okay, principal component analysis or PCA or Hauptkomponent Analyse in German is the first and kind of one of the standard approaches for reducing a d-dimensional space into a k-dimensional space where k is smaller than d. And so the idea is of, of PCA is to find a low-dimensional space <coughs> so that the reconstruction error, so if I go back to my original d-dimensional space, is minimized. So I say, okay, I'm starting my d-dimensional space, I go into my k-dimensional space, and if I would map back from this k-dimensional space to my original d-dimensional space, I actually want to minimize the error between the data points. So I have my original data point here, I map it to the low dimensional <coughs> space, map it back to the original space, and then I look to the distance of those two points. What I want to do is I want to minimize those distance. If all the points would be exactly the same, that would mean that I can go to my k-dimensional space and back to my original space without losing any information. But this is typically not the case. So if we throw something away, we ignore something, in most of the cases, we lose some information. We introduce an error, so the data point in the original space is moved to a slightly different location, and what we want to do is we want to minimize this location. And in order to do that, what PCA does, PCA basically looks into the spread of the data. So we, we look, how, does it, how is the data spread it all over our space, and then look into those directions of maximum spread. And then if we look into the dimensions of maximum spread, and then say, okay, those are those, the dimensions I'm interested in, because if I'm considering the dimensions of maximum spread, I'm actually minimizing the um, the, the reconstruction error. So let's look into, let's say, this data points. These are my data samples in a two-dimensional space, first dimension, second dimension. So the question is, do I find a lower dimensional space, let's say a one-dimensional space, so I go from d equals 2 to k equals 1, so that the error is minimized if I would map back from this one-dimensional space to a two-dimensional space. So in feature selection, the thing we are not addressing here, but in feature selection I could say I use this dimension or I could choose this dimension and simply ignore the other dimension of the data point. That's not what we want to do. What we want to do is feature extraction, so we want to find any direction in this space, say, okay, let's say this is my new dimension, in this case this is the direction of maximum spread of those data points and say this is the dimension I actually want to maintain. Okay, let's look into this example. This is exactly the same example that we had before. If I want to map those data points from a two-dimensional space to a one-dimensional space, I can actually choose this direction over here, which is indicated by this direction, and then simply project all those points on this line in this direction. So that's actually what happens here. And then I say, okay, this is my new dimension. So what I'm basically doing, I'm measuring every point here as a distance from zero along in this direction. So this takes whatever the value of 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, and so on. So I'm mapping from this two-dimensional space into a one-dimensional space. In this case, by combining both dimensions. Combining them because this this direction is not parallel to the x and to the y axis, to the uh, x or to the y axis in here. And as you can see how this is illustrated he here, one, the, the way how PCA does that is actually, it looks into the spread of the data, we can actually look into the variance 
of the data points if I represent this by a Gaussian distribution and then look into the direction in which the um, covariance matrix of those points has the largest eigenvalues. This is direct, this, the direction of maximum spread. And this is where we actually will end up with, with PCA today. Okay, so let's start with that and say, okay, we have n data points and they are all d-dimensional. Let's say I have 1,000 data points in a d-dimensional space. If I go back, in this case, d equals 2. And I want to map it to a one-dimensional space. So in this case, I would have whatever, 1,000 values and all of them were d-dimensional. So this is a d-dimensional vector, this is a d-dimensional vector, and this is a d-dimensional vector. So if we would um, have uh, d equals 2, we would have two uh, columns over here and n rows, 1,000 rows. And I can simply arrange my individual data points in this data matrix. Very similar to how you would do that, for example, in MATLAB, if you want to st would store all those data points. What we want to do is we want to map that, we want to turn that into a k-dimensional space where k is smaller than d into a new matrix. We would actually want to find this mapping to this k-dimensional space. So we want to turn this matrix x into a matrix w, which has the same number of data points but only k-dimensions, so that we have here again n vectors but those guys are not d-dimensional anymore, they're just k-dimensional. So an original example we go, or a motivating example, we go from two to one dimensions. So what we're interested in is actually getting this reduction from, k, from n to k-dimensions. This is our task and the question is how do those k-dimensions look like? So which of the d-dimensions should I use should for example be combined in order to find my k-dimensions? So is the problem that I'm trying to address clear or can I clarify anything about the problem that I'm addressing? Have you seen PCA before? No, okay. Okay, so our task is now which dimensions, which k dimensions should I actually choose or generate by combining um, my original dimensions from my original d-dimensional space in order to come up with this k-dimensional space. And then I want, of course want to find a mapping, how to map from my original d-dimensional space to my k-dimensional space and vice versa. Okay, so the first thing we can do is we can now take our data points and actually compute the mean of our data points. Just as a sum of all data points divided by n. You can also rewrite that as the product of my um, x and the one vector over here, one divided by n. So as we said, we're interested in the spread, so how these points are spread, and not necessarily where those points are in space. The first thing we do is we reduce this actually to a coordinate system where uh, the mean is in zero, zero, zero. Um, mean is in zero, zero. In this <coughs> so we take, compute the mean of all those data points and subtract it from every data point. So we have our mean reduced data points. So we can have our mean reduced data points is everything which is a bar on top is mean reduced. So it's just the original data point minus the mean in my original space. Or I can actually write this in matrix form. So my, again, my reduced um, elements are my original elements, I'm subtracting the mean. If I have this kind of mean reduced um, uh, notation, then I can actually very easily compute the covariance matrix of those points just by x transposed x and then dividing by um, n minus 1. Then I get the covariance matrix of those points of the mean, mean reduced when n of the original ones because it's just kind of a shift of this, um, this ellipse. So what I have is Given my data points, I can compute the mean and the covariance matrix of those data points. That's everything I have done so far. And what now PCA does, it says, okay, what the mean and the covariance are, these are the first um, two central moments of, my, of, a, of, of the distribution of my data points, 
And I'm only considering this first and second central moment of my um, data points in order to find those k dimensions. So I can describe my data with the mean and my covariance matrix. And now the question is how can I actually use this information, or only based on this information, find those k smaller or potentially much smaller than d to um, generate data points, corresponding data points in a low dimensional space. Okay, and so what I explained or I already sketched before is if you look to the covariance matrix and look to the individual, to the main directions of this covariance matrix, we see that some, so the covariance matrix is often not a sphere, it's often an, an ellipse or an ellipsoid. And so there are some directions which have a larger spread and some directions which have a lower spread. And if I want to re minimize the reconstruction error, I'm interested in looking to those dimensions which have a large spread because there's a largest variance in the data points. And the larger the variances in those data points, the more relevant those dimensions are if I want to minimize the error between the original data point and the data point which are mapped to my low dimensional space and back to my higher dimensional space. So the key thing is how do, we find, how do we find the dimensions which are most relevant for us based on those two quantities. And what we do is we basically look to the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of our covariance matrix. So if we look to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of my covariance matrix, I'm especially interested in the eigenvectors which corresponds to the largest or the large eigenvalues. And it tells me that this direction is a direction, so the, the first one is a direction of maximum spread given this covariance matrix. So if I look into the, into the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, this is a direction where the data spreads most. So okay, if I now have an iterative approach and select one dimension after the other, I pick first the eigenvector which corresponds to the largest eigenvalue. Say, okay, this is my first dimension. If I only have one dimension, this is the best dimension I can actually choose to capture the variance or the variation of the spread that I have in my data. So what I do is I take this and this is the f called the first principal component. This is the first dimension of my new k-dimensional space. The other effect is that once I've chosen one of those eigenvectors as my starting point, I know that all other eigenvectors are actually orthogonal to this eigenvector. So then I look to the sec second largest eigenvalue, which is orthogonal to the first eigen, uh, the eigenvector, which corresponds to the second largest eigenvalue. And this eigenvector is again is orthogonal to the first one. Select so the one, the so U2, my principal component, my second principal component, is the one which has the second largest spread. And I simply continue this process until I say, okay, I reached my, the maximum k I want to have, or until my reconstruction error is minimized. The only thing I need to do is I need to compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of my um, covariance matrix. So this guy, I need to compute the eigenvectors <laughs> and eigenvalues. Okay, I do that. Eigenvalue decomposition, typically done with SVD. I can reduce this into a form where I have a rotation matrix over here. I have a matrix which only contains diagonal elements and I have another rotation matrix here. So I can see this. I take my original space, I rotate it, and then I have a matrix here which only contains elements on the main diagonal. And this S square takes exactly, has, uh, shows exactly my, uh, the, the eigenvalues that I have. And then I can select the one which is largest, and this in this case would be this dimension. I take the corresponding eigenvector and say, okay, this is my first principal component. And I simply repeat this process k times, and then identify my k principal components. So those directions in which the data shows the maximum spread. And I get this information 
from the covariance matrix of my data points. So what the principal component does, it chooses the k eigenvectors that corresponds to the k largest eigenvalues and those are my k dimensions, my k principal components. This k can be some value between 1 and d. If I choose k equals d, of course, I have my original space. And, but typically, k is a value that is substantially larger than d for most relevant applications. So just as an example, so what you've seen here is a, some whatever, more or arbitrary, it's an arbitrary example, 65-dimensional space. And what you see here is the eigen, uh, the, 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 um, the size of the, the, the number of the, eigen, the, the size of the eigenvalue, so how large those eigenvalues are. And these are simply the eigenvectors ordered according to their size. So eigenvector 1 is the largest one, eigenvector 2 is the second largest one, so ordered in that way. Then you can see actually the, that you have a few eigenvalues which take rather large values and a large number of them which are very low. This basically means that we have a large number of dimensions which are correlated with other dimensions and which are actually not necessary in order to m more or less free of error, I won't say free of error, but generating very small approximation error if I reduce this to a lower dimensional space. And what you see here is the variance that the data still covers compared to the original variance. So I look to the, the one means the original variance that I have in my data points. And what I do is I map it, the data points to my low dimensional space and back to my high dimensional space and look to the spread that I have in those data points. So you can actually see if I take only one eigenvector, one out of 65 dimensions, I covered whatever, something like 15 to 18 percent here of my variance. But if I already, let's say, take 20 of them, I covered 95% of my variance. And if I'm something around 50, I'm basically one. So the last 15 dimensions do not contribute anything in this example. So what, we, what I can do is if I see those plots, I typically can say, okay, either I say I have a fixed k, let's say k equals 10. I don't want to use more than 10. Then I use exactly those 10 data points. Or I say I want to use be flexible in, in selecting k, and I want to select k so that I maintain 80% of my variance, for example. 80% would be here, would, I would then choose whatever, 13 dimensions, k equals 13. That's a key idea of the principal component in all this. It's kind of, was clear what we have done? Computing covariance matrix analyzing the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of those covariance matrix and selecting the eigenvectors comparing, uh, corresponding to the k largest eigenvalues. So what we have done should be kind of clear. It's also clear why we have done that. We did that in order to cover the maximum spread in my data points, assuming that the data points can well be represented by the first two central moments. So looking to the mean and the covariance matrix, say, okay, the distribution of data points can well be described by the mean and the covariance matrix. And if this is the case, then I selected the k dimensions with maximum spread and use them as my new low dimensional space. So the goal of that was to minimize the reconstruction error. If, you, if I map back from my low dimensional space to my original space, this, the sum of the squared distances of the original data location of the data point and the new one should be minimized. Okay, so once we have done that, once we identified my U1 to UK, how does the mapping look like? That's actually pretty straightforward. So mapping from my original space to my d-dimensional space is simply obtained by any data point x is mapped into x minus 
the mean, so I subtract the mean, because I, all that is in a um, mean reduced uh, elements, and then projecting it onto the first principal component. The same for the second, third, fourth, until k's. So I just subtract the mean from my data point and project it on the corresponding principal component. And this gives me k new values, which are called w1 to wk, which is my low dimensional space. So the d dimensional data point x is reduced to a k dimensional data point, where u1 to uk defines the directions of the individual dimensions. OK? Any question about that? OK, so how do I map back from this space to my original space? So now I have my k-dimensional space. How do I map back? How does the mapping look like? The f uh, what, is, what you store, do you only store this uh, new vector w1 to wk or do you also store other things like, for example, variance or the mean? So the only thing I store is the mean. I, of course, the, the vector z, which are the directions of my coordinate system. And that's it, what I store in general. And then I store for every data point w1 to wk. So the one of the things which should be clear is we subtracted from every data point the mean. So we need to kind of add the mean back. So a data point must be the mean plus something. Right? And it's basically what we get is simply a sum saying, OK, W1 is sim simply means how far have I traveled along the first principal component. So it's W times u1 plus w2 times u2 plus w3 times u3 until I reach wk plus uk. And then I'm back in my original space. I'm going to say, okay, I move whatever, what, one in the direction of the first eigenvector, 0 0.5 in the direction of the second eigenvector, 0.2 in the direction of the third <coughs> eigenvector, and so on. So the mapping again is very simple. So my my reconstructed point is the mean plus the sum of all k dimensions, simply multiplying the scalar, which are the coordinates of the point x in the low dimensional space, times the direction of the eigen uh, vector of the, my principal component. So again, a very simple mapping, very easy to execute. Of um, so the so what is lost is the information which has been stored yeah. in this. D minus k, yeah. It's not exactly d minus k um, because these are not exactly those dimensions. It can be combinations of dimensions or parts of of dimensions. But you're absolutely right. I'm reducing from a d-dimensional space to a d minus uh, to a k-dimensional space. So there is a loss of information unless the eigenvalues corresponding to the d minus k dimensions are zero. If they would be exactly zero, there would be no loss. Otherwise, there is a loss of information. As a result of that, the reconstruction error that I have is my estimated data points minus my original data point. So of course, this reconstruction error is typically non-zero. The hope is that I can select a k which is much smaller than d so that this value is still small. So again, let's go to an example. So the blue data points are my original data points in my two-dimensional space. This is a direction of the first principal component. And this is the only component I want to use because of a mapping from a two-dimensional space to a one-dimensional space. So if I then project those blue points on u1, this one generates me the red point, this one generates me this red point, this point generates me this red point, and so on. 
So those points basically lie on a one-dimensional space. I only have one dimension, which is basically how far are they away from here. So this point, this coordinate, this coordinate, this coordinate, and so on. This is what I have. This is my low-dimensional space. If I map them back into my two-dimensional space, I exactly get those red locations. As a result, the difference between the blue and the red points, this is exactly my reconstruction error. So if this is, was my point in the original space, I map it to the one-dimensional space and back into the two-dimensional world, I would end up here. And this is the error, the mistake that I did. So all those points over here, all those distances, are exactly okay, squared uh, is my reconstruction error. <coughs> and by looking into the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix of the data points, I'm actually minimizing this error here under the assumption that those points can be well represented, the distribution of those points can be well represented in the first two central moments. Okay. So what we've done now is PCA, just to summarize PCA, it's a linear dimensionality reduction technique because we have a linear mapping to a low dimensional space. It's an unsupervised approach in the sense that I don't take into account any class label. I don't know anything special about those points. I just take the points that they are and look, just say, assuming that they can be well approximated, the distribution of the points can be well approximated by a Gaussian distribution. So it makes sense to use the covariance matrix as um, descri describing the, the relevant spread of my, of my data points. I come up with a way for selecting the new lower dimensional space, so my principal components, in a way that they minimize the sum of the squared reconstruction errors. This is just by selecting those dimensions along the maximum spread. And in practice, most of the effort is actually spent computing the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of this, uh, of this covariance matrix. So any question about PCA so far? So it's clear to you why you may use it? Why you may want to apply PCA? Exactly. To reduce the dimensionality of your space. Your space is simply too high dimensional. Please. But um, this is only practical if you have the same units in your dimension, isn't it? Because, for example, in our exercise now, we have um, the mean gray value and um, the size of the fruit. And if we would combine them, we would get. Um, yeah. So, this is a little bit subtile. But, so of course, you can introduce, so the question was if the, what type of dimensions your features are actually matters. So some of them may be more important or less important. So we haven't talked about the importance of a certain dimension here at that point. Therefore, we said it's a completely unsupervised thing. We take those dimensions as they are and simply check on this reconstruction error, assuming that we actually can compute it and make sense. If you have completely different dimensions, I may say, okay, an error in dimension one may be more painful for my estimation process or may hurt more than a difference in dimension number two, and then I may rescale them. But I could simply rescale them. But of course, it's a valid point. If I have different types of dimensions which have certain properties I want to take into account, I may do that by a rescaling. It's very similar to a nearest neighbor approach where you look for nearest neighbors where one dimension is more important than another one, you may rescale your space. So it's absolutely right. Okay, now we know why we apply that. It should be clear now how we apply that. Computing the covariance matrix, computing the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and selecting the k largest ones. And then we have our mapping with these very simple formulas to map from the high dimensional space to the low dimensional space. The next thing I want to do is um, provide you with a practical example of what you can do with PCA in something called, which is called eigenfaces. And the idea is to do face recognition in images with a very simple nearest neighbor approach and exploit PCA for that in order to make that tractable. <coughs> 
So what we have is consider we have small images, let's say 100 by 100 pixels, very small images, like whatever the entries in the phone book of your mobile phone or your, the Facebook profile images, whatever it is. You have this small 100 by 100 dimensional image. This is your input X. And you want to say this image, this face, is closest to one of the faces that I have in my potentially large database. So this is my database. I have Y1 to YM. So I have M different faces stored here. I want to take this one and say which one is the largest or the smallest one. What I can do is I can simply take this 100 by 100 pixel image and compare the intensity values with all the elements that I have in my database and report the best one. Perfectly fine, I can do that. One of the problems is I need to compare every image, which has 10,000 pixels, 100 by 100 pixels, with all 10,000 pixels of every individual image. Okay, so if you treat this as um, a general problem where you just look into individual dimensions, we can say, okay, we have 10,000 dimension, dim dimensional space. If you want to store all that and do the comparisons of all pixels with all pixels, this may be slow and require quite some storage solution. Of course, depends how many images that I have. And we may claim that just a very small number of dimensions are relevant because faces kind of have a very similar structure. They are not random images. Faces have a certain structure. Maybe we can reduce it to a low dimensional space, maybe 100 dimensions, maybe 500 dimensions, instead of 10,000, so that they can be used to represent those faces very well. And then we just need to do that in our low dimensional space. And the question is, how do we effectively model the subspace um, that corresponds to the face images? And that's where PCA kicks in. Just say, okay, simply take my database. These are my, every image is a 10,000 dimensional data point. I take those 10,000 dimensional data points, take a large number of them, and simply look into this space, into this 10,000 dimensional space. Of course, this is just a very simplification um, of these 10,000 dimensions on two dimensions, just to illustrate that. And we can claim that their faces kind of look similar to some degree. It's not random images. So we may find a small number of dimensions so that all the face images, or most of the face images, concentrate along these dimensions and in the outside areas, there are no faces. So everything which is blue is a non-face image, everything which is a green is a face image. Of course, I don't go from 10,000 dimensions to two dimensions, but if I go, for example, whatever, to 500 dimensions, maybe I find all those points concentrated around one area. And this is actually the idea that, um, that the eigenfaces or the face recognition using eigenfaces um, actually does. So eigenfaces name comes from because these are the directions of the eigenvectors. And eigenfaces are kind of uh, the eigenvectors of face images. OK, so we can do that now. What we simply do is we take all our images, we compare, compute the covariance matrix of those face images. Then we compute k principal components, which are the so-called k eigenfaces. And I select this k, as I said, for example, 200, 500, something like this. And then what I do is I reduce my high dimensional space to this, from 10,000 dimensions to this, whatever, 200 dimensional space, so that I can represent all face images as a linear combination of the eigenfaces. Every eigenface is a principal component. You can express every face as a weighted sum of eigenfaces. So if I have whatever, the 10 most prominent eigenfaces are the 10 most prominent um, eigenvectors. Say, okay, this is whatever, 0 0.1 times eigenface number 1, 0 0.07 times eigenface number 2, and so on and so forth. And this way I can actually reconstruct a face. And when I then do all the comparisons, I need to do a large number of comparisons if I get a lot of input images in, I only need to be executed in this low dimensional space. I don't need to compare all these 10,000 dimensional um, vectors anymore. You can do this with, let's say, 500 or 200. So the connection between this face recognition approach and PCA clear. I basically treat my images as a long 
vectors. So my two-dimensional image, I convert this into a one long one-dimensional vector, and then I do a dimensionality reduction in this space. That's the whole trick that I'm applying. And then I go down to my low-dimensional space and say, okay, let's now do all the computations in this low-dimensional space. And if the low-dimensional space is a good representation for face images from the high-dimensional space, then the recognition should work well in this low-dimensional space. If I start putting whatever images of buildings in there, it's very likely to not work because I did the dimensionality reduction based on face images. If I then later on put different types of images in, uh, of course, the comparison may not work very well. Okay. Again, training phase. I take all my images that I have. These are my images x1 to xn. Then the first thing I do, I compute the mean. That's actually the mean phase out of all those faces. And these are the top eigenvectors. And you can perfectly see that these images resemble certain properties of faces. So here's kind of, there's kind of one colorish blob over here, and so it's slightly brighter in the background. Then we start seeing appearing some eyes, um, whatever, sometimes you can, uh, can see something like a beard um, showing up in these individual eigenfaces. So these are those prominent dimensions which I can combine with the weighted sum to reconstruct an original phase. So if I reconstruct an original phase, I take the mean plus, let's say, 0 0.5 times this image, plus 0 0.1 times this image, plus 0 times 3 point this image, and so on and so forth. And if I take my face and the face of someone you of the audience, those coefficients will be different because all faces are different. But everything is, is expressed as a weighted sum out of those elements over here. So we can now do, I can take the mean and add the first principal component. So this is the, the, uh, the principal component and then plus three times the, 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 the spread that I have in this dimension and the other dimension. So I have dark faces to bright faces. And then I have kind of, of course you cannot map it always directly to a certain property of the face, but sometimes you can see something like a beard or very large mouth popping up, sometimes it's smaller. This is the variation that you have if you vary the the coefficient of um, corresponding to the corresponding eigenphase or eigenvector. Okay, so again, how does it, the mapping works? I start with my original phase, I map it to the low-dimensional spa space and then have this k-dimensional vector. And if I want to the do the reconstruction, I said the reconstruction is the mean plus this element over here times the first eigenphase, plus W2, plus a second eigenphase, and so on and so forth. And different persons will have different values for W in here, because these are models of different, different appearances of the individual faces. So I can do that if I have an image and I have only four dimensions. These are typical faces I get out. So this is something where you see this is a face, but it's probably pretty hard to distinguish individual people. If k equals 200 dimensions, it actually works much better. We can actually recognize a face, although you wouldn't say it's a perfect reconstruction, but here is 400 dimensions, so reduced from 10,000 to 400. That looks actually, we don't see any, fa any artificial structure in those faces here typically. So it actually works very well. So we can do our comparisons in this four-dimensional spaces instead of 10,000, which dramatically speeds up the computations because I need to compare every image with the query image and I need to only compare 400 dimensions and not 10,000 dimensions. So it's a substantial reduction of computational resources that are needed in order to obtain that. Okay, it's kind of the idea clear. The idea of eigenfaces, the recognition of eigenfaces. Okay, great. So if you, oops, okay, that's kind of something screwed up here, um, would like to implement that, what you would need to do is you take your whole set of training images, so all the faces that you want to represent. You compute the mean and the covariance matrix of the set of input images. 
solve your training data. So simply take all the pixels as they are, compute the mean and the covariance. Then you do compute the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, which gives you the k principal components. And you set k manually. Let's say 400. So in the plot before, 400 seemed to be a good choice. We go for that. And what we then do, then we pass all our training data and project every face image onto this k-dimensional space. And as a result, we get a k-dimensional vector for every face, and that's what we store. This is kind of our pre-processing step. What we store for every face is not this 10,000 dimensions, just this, whatever, 400 coefficients over here. If you then want to do your, the recognition with your eigenfaces, okay, again, like that, um, we have a novel image X coming in. This is a new, the image of the new person that I want to recognize. What we do is we project this new image X onto my k-dimensional space. So we do the same dimensionality reduction we did for the training data for my query image. This gives me a k-dimensional vector. The first thing I can do is I can actually do a check and say how large is the reconstruction error if I go back to my original space compared to my original image because for this one I know the original image. And if this is very large, I may say, mm, that's not li this is unlikely to be a face. So someone put an image of a building in there. Because if the reconstruction error is large, it seems it's nothing which fits the training data well. So it's probably not a face. But that's an optional check. And then you simply do a nearest neighbor query in your k-dimensional space, and you obtain um, the closest image, which gives you a detected face in this lower dimensional space. So, yep. Eigenface is a filter. Oh, You're not. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to use it as, uh, as a means to differentiate between this is a face or not. Um, so what you what you basically mm, yeah. so what you're basically doing is you're saying, I the assumption is you have a dimensionality reduction from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space that is made for face images because you learn it from face images. What you now can do is for a new image, you apply this projection or this dimensionality reduction to this low dimensional space and then map back to the original space and simply compare the results. And if they're very far away from each other, what you're basically saying is the projection that I learned is not well suited for the data point that I have. You can say, okay, it's unlikely to be a face or it's a completely different type of person or the person has been pictured in a completely different way. Um, in this sense, yes, that is true. Okay, so what the eigenfaces was, it's basically an application of PCA, of principal component analysis, for doing face recognition in a lower dimensional space. We could do that in our high dimensional space as well, but that would require us to store all, that, all the original images and to compare a lot of pixel, pixel values. Instead, we said, let's do a dimensionality reduction and don't compare every pixel, just do this for the principal components. And this allows us to require a search in a much smaller space and need substantially less, a smaller number of comparisons for finding the closest image. Again, we assume all the persons have been pictured in more or less the same way, so if I picture a person from a completely different viewpoint, of course this will screw up the result. So there's no way of kind of aligning or morphing those images or do an image alignment as we have done that in the, exam, in the le lecture on geometric transformations, for example. So this is not addressed here. We assume that they are actually well aligned. Are there any questions so far about PCA? This is not the case, actually. We're in like a five-minute break, let some fresh air in, and then start with...